I need some traction. Thanks so much for having us. We're um, incredibly happy to be here, and I'm exceptionally happy to be um, able to interview Mike, um, the co-founder and president of Zapier. Um, I'm sure many in the audience here know about Zapier, but for, for those who don't, would love for you to tell me a little bit about Zapier. What does the company do? And particularly, maybe you can take me back to the founding. How did you guys get your start? Sure, so Zapier is uh, sort of the leading no-code automation platform. Uh, we have millions of customers who uh, use Zapier to automate workflows across about 5,000 plus integrations and apps nowadays. We just hit that milestone this year. Um, we originally got our roots back, uh, we started in uh, college town actually, in the Midwest United States, uh, Columbia, Missouri. Um, I had known, I think, Brian, so we got started at Startup Weekend actually. <laughs> so for those who are familiar with sort of the hackathons of Startup Weekend, uh, that was sort of the founding moment uh, where Brian and Wade, my two co-founders, we all got together for the first time. Um, I had never met Wade before that event. Uh, and uh, I had met Brian maybe about a year before. We got in beers a bunch and wanted to you know, work on something together, but really hadn't found, found that idea. And uh, that Startup Weekend was kind of the, the initial thing that brought us together. I was actually going to pitch my own idea at that Startup Weekend. It was a terrible idea. And it, I'm, I'm thankful Brian pitched his idea first. It was called uh, API Mixer, was the original uh, name for Zapier, uh, for about six hours before we, we found uh, a better name. And uh, as soon as I heard him pitch it, I was like, you know, that's a way better thing. I'm going to work on that this weekend. And uh, that was sort of the original kind of genesis moment. And you know, that, that weekend, we worked on building a prototype and started to s try to understand, is this actually a problem that a lot of people actually have? We thought it was a cool thing. You know, uh, APIs were getting really widespread adoption in SaaS. And uh, we thought we were doing sort of all of our side projects and consulting projects on freelancing. We're all just connecting these APIs together for our clients. And there's sort of the thesis of like, well, wouldn't it be cool if maybe more people could do that? You know, we could put a GUI, you know, a GUI a user interface on top of connecting APIs, and uh, maybe there's something interesting there. And um, that weekend, we spent a lot of time just going online and trying to find who would want this. <laughs> and uh, you can go back to you know the 29 to 2010 era where. You'd go, uh, forums were still really popular. Almost every SaaS company sold a forum. I remember viscerally the like Wufu, uh, which is a form software support forums. And there was like, you know, these threads of hundreds of customers begging, you know, these SaaS vendors to build integrations. And, you know, these SaaS vendors are sort of making rational decisions. They're like, well, we'll build the top one or two, but, you know, we're never going to build the number 10 or 50 or 100. It just doesn't make sense business wise to do it. We, there's just not enough people in the world who want it. And uh, we, that was our key insight. You know, it's like, well, okay, we're probably never going to replace the number one or number two integrations, but uh, if we could sort of serve that long tail, um, you know, that might be able to build a big business out of that. So you have a really interesting market product insight, but obviously that needed to materialize. You have a great idea. Um, and one thing that Zapier is now known for is uh, effectively bootstrapping your way to a $5 billion company. Um, Bessemer is one of the few firms that was fortunate enough to participate in the only primary capital raise that Zapier had. You got in early. <laughs> <laughs> only a million dollars. Um, and so one thing that I think would be really interesting for especially the founders in the audience to know is kind of what the dynamics were of Zapier. Obviously, we have the product and the market insight that allowed it to be self-funding for this long. Yeah, um, this is a good, good thing to ask about. Um, so, you know, I, I, have, I often like to think of Zapier as a existence proof of alternative ways to build and grow companies. Um, you know, I think there's sort of the standard Silicon Valley, uh, you know, advice that you'll get from Twitter and Substack and wherever, you know, you might listen to. And, um, you know, I think it often gets sort of uh, uh, highly polished in terms of the advice and stories that get told. And I often like to try and tell our, our origin decision making tool or like how we thought about these early decisions just to show like, oh, there are other ways, other decisions you can make that end up being, you know, a, largely successful company. And at the end of the day, there's no right answer for everyone. You sort of have to apply like a first principle set of like what's right for your business and customers and what your goals are. But uh, I like to talk about it through that. So for us, when we were uh, going through, Zapper went through Y Combinator, this is about six months after that uh, startup weekend event. And uh, this was the first and only time the entire company was all ever in one spot. Uh, we had a two bedroom of place in Sunnyvale. <laughs> uh, had to get super creative on the third bedroom. And, um, but that was the first time we were all, all together. And still just the three of us co-founders, uh, we had launched Zapier self-serve at this point. This is, I think, a decade ago now this summer. So almost right at the 10 year anniversary of uh, our first launch. And we were getting, um, we were so two, two or three months post launch. We were just waking up and doing support every single morning until like 1 p.m. And at this era, 
it was support doing support at Zapier was not very fun. Uh, you know, we had one support email inbox, and it would shard the email to all three of us. So you literally had to sit next to each other in order to do support, because otherwise you would like double up the tickets. And you know, we were like, well, okay, this isn't working because we're not even like we need more time back to go make the product better, so that we don't have the customers writing in, you know, with with the problems they have. Um, so we wanted to start hiring. And even though we did have uh, early revenue, we had self serve sign up at that point with with um, subscription billing. Uh, that revenue hadn't caught up yet to sort of enable us to go confidently start start hiring. And uh, this was at the tail end of YC, and uh, we were um, talking with uh, Sam Altman, who was the uh, was just a partner at the time at YC, and sort of his, his advice to us was, you know, well, if you, if you ever think that in the future, you, you know, fundraising is aligned with something that you think you'll need as an organization, now's a great time in the market to do it. Now, this was 2012, so, <laughs> uh, you know, it's gotten even better since then, but, um, you know, I think we really internalized that to think like, okay, well, uh, you know, I, that's, that's something we're, we're not dogmatic about not doing it. We certainly had a preference to bootstrapping and self-funding if we could because we wanted to con control more of our own destiny as a business. Um, but we sort of weighed those dynamics and said, we, we think we need to hire. That's the most important blocker to getting more customers successfully using Zapier right now is we need support. Uh, so let's go, let's go do that. Let's make that decision. Um, and I think the interesting thing about it was actually by the time we actually went through the hiring and uh, got that help under the team, uh, revenue had caught up. Um, but I still think it was the right decision, even in retrospect, because it allowed us to sort of be more aggressive in making that decision faster than you know, sitting on our heels for another three months, sort of sweating it out, waiting for you know, revenue to catch back up. And on that kind of revenue topic, I think one of the one of the things that's a little bit difficult early on is actually getting customers to monetize initially. Kind of what what was the customer pull and the draw early on that you saw, such that, and you knew that you were building something that people wanted to buy. Yeah, um, you know, I th another sort of I think common piece of uh, startup advice is uh, you know with your or original product is make sure it does one thing really well. And that was not our original product. <laughs> uh, another sort of unique thing. Zapier's original product had thousands of use cases. We launched with 60 integrations. So 60 squared was like the number of use cases uh, that Zapier supported. In fact, even through today, I think if you go look at our top use case, it's only a couple percentage points of all the usage on Zapier. So it's really, really much of a long tail product. Um, and that's, again, sort of like counter to the traditional advice that you would hear of like, well, you need to have a wedge. You need to have a very clear sort of individual use case. Um, I think what gave us sort of confidence when we were started, you know, looking at the uh, early uh, users and, and success from that um, was uh, we were do, sort of doing the thing that didn't scale. We would get on the, the product was so hard to use at this point. You basically had Wade, who was a uh, person doing all this, uh, get on the phone with you and like walk you through setting it up. He had to use your computer on your behalf to set it up. It was not, it was that hard. Um, and still, even with that degree of difficulty of using the early product, people still walked out of those first calls being like, holy shit, this solved my problem. Here, I, I, whatever you want. I'll pay you whatever you want to keep using this thing. And we didn't, this was right in the era where we, even, we didn't even have self-serve sign up yet. And, um, you know, those were the early signals that we got from even though, uh, you know, it was, the product was really hard to use, even though you couldn't even use it yourself, uh, the amount of pain that our, like, initial customers were feeling, even for these, like, long tail sets of use cases, um, what was sort of sufficiently high to give us a lot of confidence to say, okay, that's something that can sort of continue to scale. So now we've learned a little bit about some of the early decision making, the fundraising decision, early product decision. But there was there was another product decision that um, helped to bend the growth curve around 2016, which was multi-step zaps. Yes. I'd love to hear a little bit about the story of multi-step zaps, how you thought about it, and how you thought that might map into your existing customer profile. Multi-step zaps was uh, not just a feature launch. I mean, it really was an evolution of the entire product and company. Uh, so up until 2016, Zapier only supported one-to-one uh, -one integrations. That was the generic use case, right? Uh, you know, not having to copy and paste data from one to one, one app to another. And uh, we saw a pattern in our users. Uh, it was a very specific pattern. Uh, there, people were trying to do. I remember that day. They were trying to connect form software to QuickBooks. They were trying to create new customers in QuickBooks or new invoices in QuickBooks when somebody submitted a form. Problem is, uh, QuickBooks had a quirk in their API where you had to in, you had to attach the new invoice to a customer that existed. So you needed three steps at minimum in order to make that use case work. And we had some customers who figured out a way to hack Zapier to make that work, even though Zapier didn't support it officially. And we'd have customers who literally like had hundreds of these Zaps in their account, and that was uh, really interesting to us because we knew how hard it was to use the product to do it, and yet customers were demonstrating that they were like willing to put put up with that pain to do that use case. So we sat down and said, well, we're going to solve this problem. 
And while we were designing the solution for it, uh, you know, how do we make lookups in three steps work? I think Brian, my co-founder, was the key, he had the key insight to say, you know, well, it's just about as much work to support you know n number of steps as it is to do three. Uh, we, we have no signal from our users that that's something they want. We, it's it's a, just a cool thing we think would be fun to build as a tool. Uh, so, but we but we sort of. Um, went forward with the confidence that as long as it does solve that QuickBooks use case, we knew that there was going to be a subset of our customers that absolutely loved that, that product launch. And that's what really gave us the confidence to go forward. And I think the generic tool, the sort of framework we've used many times in Zapier's history is a similar one. You know, I think a lot of tool builders often get into this product trap where you, know, you end up building things that you think are cool and interesting for your customers, but you don't know until you actually put that tool sort of in their hands. And this is how we've always made product decisions to try and avoid that happening is we always got really, really clear on like, even if it's super narrow, even if it's only you know, 100 customers in our eBay, so we can actually name by email address and say, these are the people that are going to love it. We've always tried to make sure we could point to it and crisply name like, yeah, there's going to be some users here that when this thing launches, it's going to be loved by somebody. And I think I can't make the point even, the strongest evidence I can share of this is like when we launched multi-step zaps, we had a limit of 30 steps in the editor, just artificially. We were like, well, no one didn't probably want more than 30 steps. Uh, we launched on a Tuesday. Uh, by Friday night, we had, uh, we had extended it to 100 because we had customers that just literally were writing in and surprised us and said, I need more. I don't, why did you cap it at 30? And it just sort of blew our mind that uh, there were customers who would want that. Um, so we really, in that build, had no sense of how that would get used, uh, but it was really much more like built, basing it on like a, a, a cornerstone customer. No, I think it's an interesting and actionable insight for the folks in the room because it's a little bit of a chicken and egg. You're trying to make a bet on how the market's going to evolve, but you also want some proof points that there are people who are going to use it. And it seems like it was the confluence came together here. Um, you know, another dynamic of Zapier, um, which which I've gotten to see firsthand, um, is just the almost the entire time you've been relentlessly focused on the same user profile very small businesses, small mm -hmm. businesses, and, and developer first. I, I think it would be really helpful because, again, in, in somewhat of a contrarian narrative on fundraising, and then, again, now on user profile, how you made the decision to stick with that core user profile, and then maybe we can turn to, to what's next. Yeah, so we're just now starting to build a sales team 10 years in is sort of the, the TLDR on that. Um, I'll actually maybe adjust one thing. So you said developer first. I think of it as builder first. Uh, four out of five of our users are, would not self-identify as technical or a developer or an engineer. Um, you know, we really are sort of the mission of Zapier is really to put this power of this tech into more, more folks' hands. Um, and that's what we've been working on for 10 years is try, trying to sort of do that. And you know, I, I think th there's a very pragmatic decision here, which is, uh, you know, and this goes actually for how we built the company remote and whether we kept scaling it that way is, you know, is our team happy? Is the business growing? Are our customers happy? If those things are true, we're doing something right. Why, why change and jump off course when those three, three things, those boxes are getting checked? And that was very true for us serving the segment that we are, that we're serving, have served all the way through today, which is like very small businesses and micro businesses, like think one to 10 size teams and companies uh, is really where our sweet spot has, has sort of been historically. Um, you know, Zap, I think every great company, every great SaaS company goes through sort of a transition where they have to be originally a feature, then they become a product, and then they become a platform where the platform, not just a technical platform, but like a platform, a go-to-market platform, a brand platform where they can successfully expand and bring new products or new segments and just take advantage of the like infrastructure that they've built as an organization to do that. Zapier is in that mode right now. We are figuring out, going through the hard work of trying to do the unusual, unnatural work to figure out how do we take our initial product and turn it into a platform so that we can continue to have, you know, progress towards our mission for, you know, decades, decades and decades to come. So it's a very pragmatic decision to say, well, okay, we've gotten to this point. If we want to keep growing. If we look at our peer set of other great companies, other great that have continued to make progress towards their missions over, over decades, this is sort of what needs to happen right now. So we're, we're very much in sort of an expansion mode of looking at expanding the customer segments we serve, which you mentioned, alluded to, is we're starting to expand up market. And, uh, you know, this is very, I think of this as sort of a very mission aligned thing too, where there's a lot of customers that we could reach inside larger organizations where we already have one or two or three people using Zapier. Well, it's a lot easier to get their colleagues aware of Zapier and using Zapier than it is to go land a brand new, new, new account or a new customer. Um, so that's very much that. And then, the, you know, obviously we have our product expansion and bets that we're investing in as well. Um, but yeah, very much sort of a, an expansion mode of business right now. So I guess on that journey, though, when you're, 
you're doubling down on this core user profile. I'm sure you got advice to do the opposite. Move up market, invest in a sales team, uh, basically make bets that, that you didn't make and it seems like they've paid off incredibly well. I guess maybe you can help the folks in the audience uh, with the decision making framework and, and then I guess what changed such that now you knew it was the time to make those investments. Yeah, we certainly got lots of uh, advice. <laughs> um, when are you going to grow up and get an office? Uh, when are you going to grow up and get a sales team? I remember lots of people asking us these same questions. And, um, you know, I think for us, along for, on the sales side uh, specifically, uh, I think it sort of came down to, um, you know, two things. One was we didn't see the path like, I think if you would have put any other three founders in the seat of, like, Zapier, Wade, and I, I think they would have said yes to do it earlier on, if I'm being honest. Um, you know, I think we really fundamentally felt like our mission drove us on those, some of those decision-making things. So, um, you know, we really love the fact that we were serving individual people at the end of the day. You know, I think automation often has sort of a negative reputation in sort of pop culture. And often this is because I think automation is perceived as happening to people. Right, and our, our our sort of mission, what we've always tried to strive for, is how do we put automation to work for individual people, right? And in small teams and companies, that felt like the the, the most mission aligned way that we could focus our you know limited attention. We were only an eighty person, hundred person company up to that point. We couldn't go do multiple bets, right? So we had to really pick our pick our investment spot, and we chose to align our efforts and our focus with what we thought was was right for the business. Um, now these days sort of, well, what's changed about that? Um, well, you know, I think one of the biggest things is we've identified and we've started to see individual people inside larger organizations adopting and using Zapier and telling us the exact same sort of heartfelt stories of what it's meant for them personally, their team, their own career growth. And I think that's sort of, um, you know, expanded our mindset of like, oh yeah, there is a way to do that in a very mission aligned way. This is not like the 80s and 90s where you're sort of selling a big top-down automation solution into an org to the IT leader uh, and deploying you know, some use case across the org. This is really about giving this you know, superpower to everybody inside any team or company you know, uh, from small startups all the way up to you know, huge Fortune 100 companies uh, and putting that leverage into the individual user's hands. You know, it's interesting, you know, in the, in the context of a market downturn, VCs, myself included, are always talking about making sure that you understand what you're doing and making the right decisions with the capital you have. And Zapier obviously did that from the get-go, and now you're investing because you know the time is right, the buyer profiles are there, and, and to your point, you have millions of users already, you can expand, but already live, live and work in these organizations, and expanding more fulsomely makes a ton of sense. How does that map to your product roadmap? You know, we're talking about going from uh, building into a larger platform. What is the vision from here? Yeah, so I uh, kind of alluded to it. You know, I think we've got these, we're in expansion mode. I think that's like the, the easiest way to sort of summarize it. Um, one of the, I mentioned that this is an unusual thing for businesses to do because uh, you've got this huge gravity well of, uh, you know, your existing company, your exist everyone knows and has been hired to grow the current thing that you're known for, right? And it is a completely different mindset to go back to zero, right? Even when you're thinking about expanding a new customer segment, you still are having to get back in that founder mindset, right? Of like going zero to one. I have zero of these customers. How do I get to one, <laughs> right? You got to do things that don't scale. And that is a very unnatural thing, you know, once you've started to hire more specialized roles and teams into the organization. I think this is one of our, our big challenges, actually. And, you know, what we've spent a lot of time is, okay, how do you create that clarity internally of who's working on what and how do you create clarity of like what bets really matter so that you can create space for the stuff that you know on paper only has you know 100k annual revenue <laughs> against the you know huge machine that's got hundreds of millions of annual revenue um, but you know that like well if we don't invest in that you know next s curve eventually that first one is going to decelerate right the, i think this is the story of every so every single product ever in the history of the world is uh, eventually they decelerate decelerate into sort of irrelevance somebody else is going to beat you if you don't continue to keep pushing on and keep making it great over time um, so we're very much back in that sort of uh, trying to get back in that founder mindset, really, for these, for these expansion projects where it's like, okay, yeah, how do we do things that don't scale? How do we get back in that zero one? And it's been trying to spend a lot more time with founders in that space knowing that's really important for us. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's great to keep that ethos and like making sure that you're continuing to build, building, innovating, and the like. Um, I guess before we leave, do you have any final words of wisdom for the folks in the audience? And, you know, it's, it seems easy when you put it on the slide, building a $5 billion company, but any final parting words? I mean, I just think like, uh, so think of Zapier as an existence proof. You're gonna encounter a lot of decisions. I know a lot of you are building zero companies from zero right now. Um, 
you know, think from first principles, what's right for your business? What are your goals? You know, I, and look at things like where you hire or are you gonna take fun fundraising or how much? Think of those as tools that you get to use and choose when you wanna use them or not. They're up, it's up to you, you get to have the final call here, right? No one else gets to tell you what, what is right for your business, only you do. Um, so I think that's probably the key takeaway. And then also, I would, you know, if there are any founders here that are working in sort of the no-code, low-code automation space, uh, I'm trying to get back into that space and meet network. So uh, you know, if you're working there, come say hi or you can shoot me an email, uh, mike at zapier.com. Awesome, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I need some traction. You need some traction. Let's get some traction.